It's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Abbott. My day job is that I run a marketing company called Swirl, but um, I co-founded a non-profit as a lockdown project called the Old Vine Conference, which is about showing that old vineyards, heritage viticulture, actually is a, a sort of a viable category and a really powerful way to talk about wine and farming in wine and the agriculture of wine as part of wine culture. As part of that Old Vine Conference, we partnered with a great organization called the IWSC Foundation. This is the charitable arm of the International Wine and Spirits Competition, um, which was set up under the direction of um, Christelle Guibert and the owners of the IWSC Foundation to donate um, funds to projects within wine that um, contribute to the sustainability and the diversity of the wine sector. So the IWSC Foundation actually were one of the Old Vine Conference's first um, sort of institutional sponsors. And one of the things we wanted to do about the Old Vine Conference was as well as all the marketing stuff, you know, all the pizzazz on the tastings and to highlight great wines is also to encourage research into heritage vineyards and heritage viticulture and the varieties that are therefore recuperated through that. So IWSC Foundation actually gave us a grant and after a lot of um, um, sort of searching and discussions, we basically worked with um, heritage vineyards of Turkey, who you're about to hear from soon, and through the IWSC, we were able to fund this research that they're about to talk to, you, to talk to you through today. And the research isn't just academic, it is academic. As you'll see, they partnered with very credible academic partners. But I think it's really important that we make these, um, this research live, you know, because actually um, a heritage vineyard, if it's not in a bottle being sold and loved, um, and that love translating into a higher price, we lose um, this diversity in viticulture and all the culture that goes behind it. So um, you can see more about the Old Vine Conference um, at our website, but I really want to hand over now to uh, Gojdem and Umay and the other members I know of the um, Heritage Vineyards of Turkey team, who are also fabulous, and you must make sure you speak to them as well, um, who are going to take you through um, their organization, um, the organisation existed beforehand and we were just able to yeah. really give this um, like, like a, a focus, a boost yeah. and, and the results of the research they're going to talk you through and then the fruits, the delicious drinkable fruits of that research are in front of you. So I think that's everything from me. Yep. Have I forgotten anything? I don't think so. Right. <laughs> I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, welcome. Uh, and thank you the Old Wine Conference and IWSC Foundation for the opportunity. Without you, we would not be able to do this research uh, in 2022. So this is a first for Turkey because for the first time actually, uh, different wineries collaborated uh, for a project. So the wines you are about to taste are all fresh, uh, coming from 2022. And apart from number one, uh, they are all tank samples. Only number one was released. So in the other room, we have a walk around tasting where you will see older versions of the, this variety called Karasakis. Uh, Maybe just before you start, uh, I should tell uh, about the Heritage Wines of Turkey. This is like an initiative of volunteers. We are all partners of uh, di different professionals, but we are still very committed to our a culture and the viticulture uh, of vineyards in Turkey. It's something which is very rare and unknown, yet it's very, very um, lives for, I think, more than thousands of years. So we try to record, uh, reveal the, you know, what is unknown and uh, increase awareness for uh, the old wines of uh, Turkey, which is, I think, very unique and not seen from the maybe total image of under Turkey. So, uh, I mean, we will keep doing this, but this research basically, which was funded uh, by IWC and thanks to Old Wine Conference, is si something like a blueprint for us because there are so many different areas which you're going to maybe taste here as an example. And we really want to carry on in the 
uh, next room with the following so many different varieties. Uh, and th that's how it starts. Yeah, and so. when it is Turkey, I mean, the, the figures, the numbers are quite misleading because this area, this region is uh, quite unknown to even many wine professionals, uh, consumers in Turkey. This is a very small region in Turkish standards, but there are 1000 hectares of vineyards of this variety existing. But 10 years ago, it was 2000. So we are losing them in a very uh, fast pace. So uh, we uh, will be talking about this region in particular in the masterclass. There are reasons why we focused on this region. Uh, but uh, we hope that this, the highlights, the research findings will uh, shed a light on the rest of Turkey that you will be tasting in the other room. So uh, a bit of history to uh, bring some context. Um, the word old uh, has other uh, meanings when it is Turkey. Uh, because uh, it is not only the wines uh, that are old, but uh, I mean, uh, all the traditions, the history, it is all there. I mean, all the pictures you see are, uh, were taken uh, within the vineyards, actually. Uh, because uh, as you all know, uh, especially southeastern Turkey is one of the uh, areas where the grapevine was first domesticated and then spread to the rest of the Western world. And all the um, civilizations that inhabited what we call Anatolia were uh, growing grapes and making wine out of them, including the Hittites, the Urartians, the Phrygians, then the Hellenistic period, uh, the Byzantines, and then the Ottomans, of course. Uh, when the Turks uh, conquered Anatolia in 1071, they were already Muslims. So uh, the alcohol consumption is always, and it still is, um, a political issue in Turkey. So during the Ottoman times, uh, all the non-Muslim communities were allowed to make wine, uh, pursue its trade, uh, but the Muslim community were uh, prohibited from using it. But uh, when you are walking through vineyards, I mean, it's all there. For example, this is a vineyard in Urla. And when they were just organizing the terraces, they found all these clay vessels buried underground from the Greek times. Uh, this is another uh, rock card press uh, just within the vineyards in Chömelek. And wine number 44 in the other room is coming from these vineyards. So uh, old is really old when it is Turkey. Uh, during the time of the Republic, uh, there were constructive efforts to uh, boost winemaking by the new uh, Turkish Republic. And there was uh, the Tekken, uh, which is the uh, government institute that was uh, collecting all the grapes from the farmers and making wine out of it. But private enterprise was also allowed to make wine. Uh, then came the current government in 2002. Uh, so uh, it's a very Islamist uh, conservative government and uh, they keep pushing uh, prohibitions and bans on the consumption of alcohol. And the one in 2013 uh, was uh, the strictest yet because it is almost a cocktail of all the bans from all around the world. So you cannot criticize it when you criticize why do we have to sell alcohol uh, before 10 o'clock? He says uh, in France it's the same. But why can we, can't we operate websites? Uh, because it's the same in uh, Faroe Islands that was initiated <laughs> in 1960. So uh, you cannot oppose to that. There is, a, uh, there is an example somewhere in the Western world, always. But I wanted to get political. If you did have a change of government, do you think it would be easier for the wine uh, sure, definitely, but it yeah. will take some time because yeah. there are many other institutions to fix before that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <There> but, <laughs> but obviously, yeah. It, uh, yeah. I mean, there is no, there is nothing that uh, keeps you from drinking, uh, even on the street, maybe. But uh, you feel the pressure. Uh, there yeah. are many examples yeah. we can talk about. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's perhaps just worth saying it's a very timely consideration because big elections going on. In <laughs> yeah, we are just between right yeah. two elections now. Yeah. Yeah. So it was that close, but we lost again. Uh, so there's a second round uh, next week. Don't say that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if we go into politics, I mean, I've been watching the news. I'm here for two days. So 
I know about the minister. Uh, I think she's going to resign so because of a speeding yeah. ticket. I mean, that's so funny for us, you know, because just one week ago, I mean, uh, Erdogan was showing a deep fake video in a rally attended by 1.7 million people showing the opposition leader shaking hands with the terrorist group head. That was fake. But I mean, he showed it as it was true. So we are coming from such a background. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I will just mention for 10 minutes about uh, the situation in Turkey now overall. Uh, we are the sixth largest grape producer in the world, uh, producing more than 4.2 million tons of grapes. That's too much, actually. But we are only using 3% of this for winemaking. The rest, uh, we either eat fresh, uh, turn into molasses, uh, we dry them, we are the world leaders in raisin production, or we also make uh, the most favorite drink of Turks, rakı, out of fresh grapes now. The total production is less than uh, 1 million hectoliters, making us somewhere between Uruguay and Canada uh, in the production of wine. The share of exports is very small, 3% again, by volume. And by value, it is just 8.5 million pounds, and that's it. Same value as just 1,200 cases of 2010 Chateau Latour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the consumption per head is less than one liter, which includes all the hotels uh, attended by the Russian tourists in the Mediterranean. And uh, we have only 185 wineries. So just for comparison, you have uh, 197 wineries in the UK now, uh, with just 3,758 hectares. But in Turkey, we have 000, more than 400,000 hectares, uh, with just 185 producers. And there are no uh, protected designations of origin. Yeah. It's self-regulated in Turkey. The Ministry of Agriculture is not interested at all uh, about these. Uh, but we have a very good collection vineyard uh, in the Trace, in a province called Tekirda, where we have almost close to 1,500 different varieties. And uh, Gözdem, I think they have close to seven or eight, uh, Sabiha, you know, uh, wines per each yeah, variety. Yeah, eight. Yeah, no. it's a very serious yeah. uh, vineyard six over there. Eight, yeah. Six wines per variety. And there was a, a DNA uh, testing uh, for 1,150 of them, and 850 of them were found to be separate varieties. Of course, these are not, not all of them are uh, used for winemaking. Uh, most of them are table grapes, apparently. Um, wine grapes published in 2012 mentions about 26 varieties used for winemaking in Turkey in 2012. Today the number is 60. In 2022 vintage we had 60 local varieties and next room you will have 28 of them. Uh, you will have a chance to sample. Um, Similarly, OIB, uh, Julius Kuhn Institute mentions about uh, similar uh, varieties, 1,075 in the case of Julius Kuhn, 709 uh, for OIB, and also the study in Adelaide University by Kim Anderson and Signe Nelgen mentions about 35 varieties used for winemaking in Turkey, including the international ones. So this is the uh, list now. And in the brackets, you will see the corresponding wines over there in the other room. So we have, out of this 60 wines, uh, varieties, we have 28 of them coming from old wines. Because some of them uh, do not have uh, old vineyards. Uh, they are coming from young vineyards. Uh, so uh, the figure is 60 now which shows that there is an interest because it didn't start like that. The modern Turkish winemaking that started in 1990s were based around international varieties. Yeah. I mean, when you first came in 2000, yeah. 
tent. Uh, there was a lot of big yeah. swinging yeah. cab. Yeah. 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 And Sauvignon Blanc yeah. and Chardonnay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, grape growing map of Turkey. So the distribution of the vineyards, it's mainly in the Aegean because of the variety Sultaniye, which is used mainly for uh, making raisins. Uh, it's Thompson seedless. Uh, but we have a wine uh, and yeah, the winemaker is here today, uh, Jose. Uh, so we have a, a wine made out of Sultania grapes. Uh, many people say uh, in Turkey that you cannot make decent wine out of this variety, but you will see for yourself. Uh, why? Have we been talking about all these uh, vineyards, 410,000 hectares now? Because we are losing them at a great pace. So uh, we are fifth in the world in the area under wine. But we are leading the world as well in the pace that we are losing these vineyards. It's now 2.7%. Whenever I renew this presentation, it's another 10,000 hectares loss. So I just did this uh, the other day. It was 419 hectares uh, last year. Now it is 410,000 hectares under wine. So within the last 34 years, we lost 170,000 hectares of vineyards. This is important because all these vineyards are uh, home to uh, native varieties. It's not Cabernet Sauvignon or Maros. They are very fresh. They are very young vineyards in Turkey. What we are losing are uh, local varieties when we lose vineyard areas. Uh, 170,000 may just sound like a normal figure. So just for comparison, it is 15% more than the total vineyard area of Australia, the world's fifth largest wine, uh, wine producer. Or 35 percent more than the total vineyard area of South Africa, 70% uh, more than the vineyard area of each of these countries, Greece and Germany, and equal to the total vineyard area of Hungary, Austria, and Georgia combined, just in 34 years. Uh, and this is constant. I mean, the pace that we are losing these vineyards is constant. Uh, only within the last four years, uh, the vineyard area that we lost equals to the total vineyard area of New Zealand. Um, so why did we focus on this uh, not very well-known region in the trace called Chanakkale, the wines of which you are about to taste? Because this is the area, when we search within Turkey, this is the area that is losing the vineyard area the most. So uh, just some geographical information. This is a province in the uh, northwest of Turkey. Uh, and in Turkey, uh, as there are no designations, uh, we just uh, give the regions uh, about the uh, vineyards according to the geographical regions. We have seven of them. And they are named after either the sea uh, that they are neighboring or their position within Anatolia. So we have central Anatolia, the Black Sea region, the Mediterranean, southeast Turkey, eastern Turkey, the Aegean, and Thrace. So this region is uh, on western Thrace, but it is normally called North Aegean in Turkey. So there are 14 different uh, provinces within Çanakkale and uh, the region that we focused on is Bayramic uh, where most of the vineyards are. This is landlocked. This is uh, one of the landlocked uh, provinces within Çanakkale and this is uh, where uh, we have the bordering with the <coughs> neighboring province called Balıkesir and there are the Ida mountains. So historically also this region is very important because this is the area where the uh, Gallipoli War was fought and also the ancient war of, alleged war of Troy was fought as well. Also uh, in Turkish history it's important because there was a Canadian mining company that cut 300,000 trees in the Ida Mountains and this is the aftermath. But the protests uh, at least stopped uh, the mine to be built, but that was the 
uh, that is the region at an aerial view after that devastation. Uh, whenever you go to Bayramich, uh, you will most likely see such. Uh, we, uh, that's all taken by us, members of Heritage Vines of Turkey. Whenever you go there, you will see uprooted vineyards, uh, uprooted vines. It's very normal to uproot them due to many reasons that I will pass Gözlem to talk yeah. about. Okay. Um, I'll just go through a very, very briefly through the research findings because you have the books and you can read them through. But just to give you the headlines and uh, just to briefly show uh, how the uh, region was in, uh, influenced uh, with so many things of, you know, cluster of uh, issues of pr uh, problems like the domestic uh, migration because people are not having enough economic return from agriculture and their land or also uh, the grape wine uh, area uh, was uh, uh, giving all the, the, the vineyard owners uh, were giving their wines, uh, the, the, the grapes, to the um, plant of uh, brandy, uh, which was owned by the Monopoly until 2004. The Monopoly was privatized uh, and uh, the uh, brandy plant, which was uh, a source of uh, place for all the vineyard owners to give their grapes, was shut down in 2007. So that was a kind of big uh, going down uh, for them to what to do with these wines as well. But it's not only that. The government, there was a big nursery uh, for the you know, sustainability and the future generation of uh, vineyards. So they shut down that one as well in 2008. And uh, the vineyard owners are left alone. So, I mean, there are a cluster of issues going on here. And it's a kind of example uh, for us to see. Uh, this research that we did uh, took us like four months, uh, pre-research, the field research, and writing the, you know, the report. Uh, so it's like about the understanding uh, of the di changing dynamics, what's going on here in the characterization of the vineyards, the vineyard growers condition and uh, this is a reflection of uh, other regions of Anatolia as I said um, so we did like uh, the field research in last year during the harvest time almost uh, like within a month it was a, a cooperation with the agricultural directorate of that region uh, and he went basically to each one of the 36 villages, each one of the sites, each one of the parcels, and we recorded through the satellite each one of the parcels, and uh, we recorded their age, their characteristics, whether they are irrigated, whether uh, they are owned by whom, all these kind of things. We have a huge database at the moment. Um, and uh, we also... Uh, took the results uh, in the report, as you will see. So as I was mentioning, again, you can see the reflection of the decrease in the vineyard areas here as well, like 43% of the vineyards uh, was going, uh, went down for the last 10 years. Uh, there is uh, the, the record at the moment that we made, uh, 1,631 vineyards uh, at that area. And, um, and the owners, uh, most of them, they have like two, uh, two, three small vineyards. Uh, the thing is that um, one of the also very critical uh, things that you, we uh, recorded is that uh, the vineyard zones uh, is owned by almost gardens. It's like less than one hectare. It's not a big vineyard that will uh, result in economic value. So they own this, they still keep it. But uh, in order for them to generate value, they have to create a you know, quality uh, value, uh, which is not uh, going on at the moment. Uh, the age of the vineyard is very critical because you can, have, you can see lots of old vineyards, uh, but you cannot see new vineyards. The ages of the new vineyards, are the number of uh, new vineyards is very, very low. And for the last five years, there is no new vineyards upcoming, which means that we're going to lose that area very soon because there is no policy from the agricultural, uh, in locals, you know, regional, any kind of authorities or any association uh, over there. Uh, we produced for the first time the first viticulture map, uh, which you have it on your desks uh, for the first time. So in this uh, map, 
uh, each one of the parcels are uh, by village is uh, you know uh, shown and this is the first you know art cartographic map for us from Turkey we hope to, to make it throughout Turkey all around I hope we can and um, we also conducted a face-to-face -face research with the wine growers to understand the, you know, the future and uh, their own condition. Uh, they said that, uh, well, uh, they are still growing a lot of uh, domestic grapes, but the international st uh, grapes also started to merge in to the region. Uh, the Karisakas, which we are going to taste today, is the most dominant grape variety still. They don't irrigate their vineyards. They just go very, very uh, few times. Uh, they are like self-made <laughs> vineyards in this, uh, in this area. Uh, the uh, overall uh, uh, yield of the vineyards is very high, which also maybe made the vineyards survive uh, so far. Maybe they could have uh, lo uprooted it much more faster. However, the yield is too big so uh, because of the brandy uh, production so they were uh, focused on more on the volume rather than uh, the uh, you know the quantity equality so we ha we we really want to change that uh, if they get some more value uh, to produce quality uh, grapes that might be also a changing uh, factor for them um, they're working by themselves in the vineyards, they're themselves and their families, uh, maybe a few neighbor villagers, nothing, nobody else. Um, and they are very, very old and they are getting older and they don't have their kids with them, uh, neither going to agriculture, university or school or helping them because they already left the villages. So uh, this is the situation at the moment. Uh, like a multi-layer issue yeah. going and, on uh, there. If I may interrupt, it's yeah. always the case. I mean, the uh, owners of such old wines are always old, uh, old people. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, we also, along with Levon, uh, have a winemaking project just supports uh, heritage wines of Turkey. And we were meant to buy some Beylerce grapes from the growers. And we just uh, wanted some photos from the vineyards and they did not have uh, the new generation uh, cellular phones. So they had Nokia 6110s. Uh, they couldn't send me photos of their vineyards uh, for a very long time. Uh, it is always the case. And, yeah. and the danger maybe, uh, maybe a gift for the region. Uh, there are now two irrigation dams built by the government. So uh, the vineyard owners have a chance to uproot the wines and plant apples uh, and a and specific type peach, of peach yeah, yeah. there, which is Famous very popular because the they sell the grapes at 2.5 Turkish liras uh, per kilo, which is 10, uh, cents, cents. 10 yeah. cents only per kilo. But they can sell uh, the peach at uh, twice or three times, three times. this uh, yeah. value. So uh, because of these irrigation yeah. dams, uh, they are undecided between going on or yeah. turning to either table grapes that they can also sell at yeah. higher prices or to other fruits. Yeah, but they these are. Um, yeah. These are generally unirrigated. Aren't they? Yeah, they are all un unirrigated. All unirrigated. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, the thing is that uh, they started to uh, put some uh, table grape wines in their vineyards to just get some more value. Uh, so it's becoming very mixed up. And also there are issues of some of the vineyards are American rootstock because there is phylloxera in the region, but some of them are not because there is no nursery. So they are just budding and they're putting themselves, so, which is like a really mixed vineyards going on. Uh, plus, they say that uh, we don't need too much money to uproot our vineyards to continue. If the, the price would be like 25 cents or 30 cents, they're okay with it. And uh, by the way, in the other regions of, of Turkey, uh, some wineries are paying like almost uh, more than one pound to Sauvignon Blanc uh, for a yes. kilo. Yes. That's uh, something that I, we should also mention. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the, this is the mindset of them. It's a balance sheet. Uh, each one of the harvest time, when they get the prices from the, uh, the only, uh, uh, the few wineries there, which are like mostly table grape producers, which they sell like bulk uh, of their uh, grapes. Uh, they look at the price and they decide, shall I continue or not? That kind of a balance sheet that they have in their mind. 
Okay, so... Uh, so, uh, it's all good, I mean, uh, making this research, but it doesn't mean much in Turkey if you don't show an example. Uh, so, we asked a couple of wineries to help us in 2022 and support our project. So, uh, there were only two wineries working with this variety in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So, four other wineries uh, promised help and they did so. So, we are tasting eight wines from six wineries today. And they are uh, Çamlıca, uh, which is number one, a prominent producer uh, in Trace, mainly making uh, Bordeaux wines out of Cabernet Sauvignon. They are brilliant wines, by the way. But uh, he promised, surprisingly, to help us with number one. Uh, Heraki, uh, the owner and winemaker of which is uh, here, Jose, uh, also contributed. Pasheli, uh, this is one of the wineries exist. I mean, he was the pioneer actually uh, working with this grape. He introduced Karasakis grapes to Turkey in the first place. So he also helped us. Sula again, after Pasheli, but they were making wines. And, and they were uh, also important because they made a sparkling, they made a, a Blanc yeah, de Noir well. out of this grape. And also different renditions of Karasakas. They aged Karasakas in uh, barrels, which you can find in the other room as well. Yaban Collective, this is our winery by Levon. And we are just uh, producing very limited amounts of wine to support heritage wines of Turkey. And Yedi Bilgeler, uh, based in Izmir, Selçuk. Uh, they also made a wine, uh, I think the last, uh, the sixth, number six wine yeah. uh, out of Karasakas this year. So this is also a first. I mean, there are not such collaborations in Turkey. So just, so just to kind of pick up on that. So having got the research project underway and <coughs> located some really good vineyards, good fruit, they then mobilized their <laughs> winemaking winery network. So the wines in this tasting are very much, the, most of them are here because of the research, but they didn't just want the research just to stop at the, the beautiful research, yeah. lovely though that is. So a lot of these wines are kind of, um, they're like prototypes or, you know, the first release. And as, yeah. um, as you might mentioned, actually, all of them apart from the first wine are actually um, pre-bottling. So they've been um, bottled for this tasting. So mm -hmm. it's, you're really kind of tasting a very, very beginning of like a, a resurgence for these for this variety. Yeah. Uh, because that, uh, that is the uh, basic uh, idea behind heritage wines of Turkey. We just want to show an example by making wine and show both the consumers and the winemakers that there is this potential, starting with Bayramic, but also our project uh, working with many different uh, varieties. We just want to show that these vineyards and these grapes are over there. Just use them uh, instead of using international grapes because there are a great potential in Turkish vineyards and we should, unless we use that potential, we will be losing them all. So, uh, before we stop Start, talking, yeah. we just want to mention about just other viticulture areas in danger in just a couple of yeah, minutes, yeah. because these, uh, some of these yeah. varieties you will find in the next room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are like, as Umay mentioned, 28 indigenous varieties. Three uh, actually uh, international varieties, but they came to Turkey in 50s, 1950s, which became like a terroir to them, which are Semillon, Game and Carignan. Uh, and these are like 50 old wines, uh, 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 above 35 years old. And there are 18 collaborating uh, wineries, which is great for us. Uh, sorry. Um, so these are the regions, uh, just to see the pictures uh, from the... Uh, different zones, which is south part of Turkey. Turkey is a big country. <laughs> and uh, this is Middle Anatolia mm -hmm. from Cappadocia. Yeah, wine number one in the Volker and yeah. tasting coming from Cappadocia, Emir wines. And these are Erdős from 1700 plus uh, altitude from the east, far east part of Turkey. And they are ungrafted, by yeah, the way. Yeah, they are ungrafted. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, Mount uh, Hassan looking to the old wines together with Sabiha and the uh, Galveri winery owner Odo. 
Uh, so it's uh, number 1933. This is the Iraqi border, by the way, in Shurnak. Uh, so the ungrafted, very old, 100 plus years old uh, vines uh, from that area. The, the name of the grapes are so unknown even to Turkish people as well. Uh, the reason why is uh, because we all have been uh, to these vineyard areas and these guys uh, looking quite Turkish. Uh, by their face, actually speak a very different language among each other. So when I asked them, uh, what language uh, is this that you are speaking? Is it Arabic? Because it sounded like Arabic. Uh, they said, no, it's uh, not Arabic. It is Aramaic. Uh, it is, yeah. So it's not only the vineyards that are old. I mean, the I mean language where on earth, and the people, where yeah. on earth yeah. would people speak and Aramaic? This is why yeah. it's so important, because they basically hold these cultures. Yeah. Uh, and mm. I asked the guy, Marcus, uh, oh, Aramaic, the ancient language of uh, Jesus Christ. And he said, oh, Jesus Christ is just a boy. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they are serious, you know. So the, the world old really means much more than that. And by the way, uh, one oh, other thing, I mean, uh, and it's a good slide to mention yeah. this. Oh. Or, or maybe can we pass to the... You have to. Next <laughs> I cannot go back. You can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so these are arboreal trees in Bodrum. Yeah. Uh, the wines are here, 21 and yeah. 42, one rose and These are red. from the exchange of people's time. They left it, yeah. So Gama and Semyon. From Trace. From Trace. Which we have. Also southeastern Turkey. This is the earthquake region, by the way. <laughs> That's the, almost the center oh, of the earthquake. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so uh, ancestral wines from uh, Konya, a very unexpected place in central Anatolia as well. Uh, 11 and 13, two whites. Uh, and, the yeah. one that I wanted to mention was Beylerce, actually. Ah. It's also wine number seven, I think. Uh, we were just uh, buying in grapes from uh, that area. And the guy told us that the wines are 25 to 30 years old. And he said, ah, they should be about 35. But OK, let's try. So we bought one ton uh, of uh, Beylerce grapes, which is Begleri or Trapsatiri, the same, same variety, by the way. So uh, we just bought in the uh, grapes. We made the wine that you will be tasting in the next room. And this year, we were just about to print the labels. So on the labels, we show the age of the vineyard. So I called him again. He already sold the uh, grapes anyway. And uh, sorry, what was the age of the vineyard? And he said they are 80 years old. <laughs> they just want to hide. They just want to, because uh, they think that as they get old, uh, the quality and the uh, yeah. yield decreases a lot. So that's the uh, main understanding in Turkey. They just want to keep it as a secret. They just don't <laughs> want to tell. Yeah. So thank you, thank you very yeah, much for thank listening. You. Yeah. So we so, go through the... So let's taste the yeah, wines. Yeah. We would really like to yeah. sort of run this as, um, you know, as an interactive session. Um, and um, we'll sort of chat through the wines. I just want to say, as a bit of context, um, I don't know if many of you have um, had a chance to try a lot of wines from Turkey. But there was a real trend for these very intense, um, deeply coloured, kind of um, impressive, but not necessarily um, kind of lovable wines. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, That's a very polite very, way to know, describe. But, yeah. but there was a big kind of look at my massive wine sort of thing going on. And, um, and I think what's really compelling about these wines is how they are intense but they are so fresh and balletic and um, with a really kind of ethereal perfume and I think so exciting when you consider lots of these are basically prototypes I mean the first wine I think is very much a finished wine and I think you can really tell um, so should we talk about the and first wine together sure yeah. yes yeah yeah yes Yes. Uh, Karasakas uh, normally, actually, it always ripens uh, mid September. Um, it's a, uh, it has uh, big round uh, berries with I'll thin you, skins, yeah. uh, which is uh, thin, thin skins. skins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, 
we think that there are two different clones of it in the Bayramich area because uh, there are some with just thicker skins giving more color as you will see in the setup here uh, especially number six and uh, number uh, three and four yeah that's uh, they are how they look like this is the grape yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, uh, in the book, page 36, there is a description of the variety as well. So, uh, it ripens in mid-September, but there is a reason why the harvest, harvest always starts in September the 15th, because uh, there is a huge winery there, which makes uh, just table wines, but uh, they announce the price in mm. the 15th of September. Then, so, everybody waits until then, and then they start picking, which lasts like uh, two weeks uh, in the region. But before that, I, I mentioned there were only two wineries, Pacheri yeah, and Sula, the, the wines of which are included this here. Big, big uh, they made wine uh, out of these uh, grapes from several different villages. But uh, starting with this project, there are wines, apart from the Sula wine, they are all coming from a specific village. So especially eight and uh, seven, uh, which are our wines, they were made by Jose under the same uh, vessels, same <laughs> winemaking, but coming from two different villages, one from Chavushlu, one from Kyosela. Uh, I think Car Karasakis is, is considered to have moderate to very fresh acidity. Yeah. Um, uh, always high alcohol. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's why it was used for brandy. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it can have tannins, uh, depending on the winemaking, but uh, medium, uh, medium plus tannins, we can say. Uh, and the main belief is that it doesn't produce quality wine in Turkey. And so it doesn't it was, age. And it doesn't age. Yeah, that's the main belief. Yeah. Yeah. And we have not seen actually an <laughs> aged version, so <laughs> yeah. we don't know as well. And it's a quite a high yielding variety, yeah. obviously. Uh, and also the Kuntra uh, in Bozjada is the same, but they call it Kuntra in okay. Bozjada. Uh, it's the same grape. So in the tasting sheet, you will also find a map showing the different uh, villages. And also in, on the tasting she sheets, the villages are donated, uh, denoted for you to see. So should we cut through the wines? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so wine number one. Yes, um, made by a producer called um, Chamlija, which was established by um, a gentleman called Mustafa Chamlija, who's a significant wine collector in Turkey. He's one of the most obsessively <laughs> driven people I've ever met. And I think has <laughs> really, um, he's really a, a pace setter for absolute quality aspiration in um, of Turkish wine. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, he was very much making wine that were in, was influenced really by what he loved in wine, which was Bordeaux. Bordeaux yeah. um, the people who are into wine in Turkey are seriously into wine. I think I've, I've never had as much DRC as when I went out to Istanbul. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think, yeah, it was, yeah. So the Turkish wine drinking culture is quite it's quite a small part of the population but when they're into wine they're really into wine and i think what you're seeing is really a reset of turkish production where really their the paradigm for international varieties being the way to quality has been reevaluated and um certainly sabiha who's here in levan and, and actually gojdem and umay have very much been part of that so um i love the aromas of this wine and then it very floral, yeah. beautiful kind of wild strawberry, quite ethereal aromatics. And then the palate, I find actually very kind of sumptuous, um, sweet spice. There is a generosity. Um, is there some new oak here a little bit? Um, I mean, it's got that kind of that feeling to it. I don't know if, it, if there yeah. is, it's very well managed, but you know, I think it's it's a very no. assured. Yeah. There's no new oak. No new oak. Yeah, no. only old. Yeah. It's just the sort old of lovely oak. Old, old, old oak. Old. Yeah. Um, so um, 
I mean, yeah. it's actually 15% alcohol, which I must admit which when I, I first tasted it, three months. didn't particularly stick out to me. Um, and it reminds me almost of something almost a bit Sicilian. I don't know, that kind of tension you get with floral, quite delicate aromatics, and then actually quite a, a rich, you know, but resistant palate. That, um, that's how I find yeah. it. <laughs> uh, there's always red fruit in Karasaka's mm. wines, but mm -hmm. it's not like strawberries or raspberries. It's rather cranberries or uh, cornelian cherry, if you are familiar with that fruit. Crabbies. It's more savory. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, maybe one thing uh, in general about Turkey that we should mention, because uh, you said, which is a very nice word, that it is a reset about Turkish wine in general, the other room or this project. Because um, there's a turning point in Turkish winemaking, which is 1923, when there was a forced population of the Armenian and the Greek minorities. I mean, they were sent to their uh, countries and the Turkish people living in Greece were sent to Turkey. So all the people uh, tending these vineyards and making wine out of them were forced away from their vineyards. So uh, almost overnight, Turkey lost that winemaking tradition, um, all the rituals, all the festivities overnight. So uh, we kept some of the vineyards because we are using the grapes for other purposes. But uh, it was quite a shock. And before that, in, uh, we have records of 1904, where Turkey produces 340 million liters of wine. And in 1923, the record shows that it was only 2 million uh, hectoliters. So that was a huge damage to Turkish winemaking. We almost lost all our heritage, all our memory about wine growing and winemaking, actually. So uh, when we uh, came back uh, in the 1990s with the understanding of making quality wine, it was international grapes. Uh, we had two companies that were uh, leading the uh, efforts and they were all planting international varieties, their own vineyards, chateau style wineries within the vineyards. So that set an example for the rest of the followers. So many Turkish wineries followed that path uh, planting international varieties. So when you first came in 2010 or 11, oh, no, it, was, it was 2008. Uh, eight. Eight? Yeah. Oh. I remember because yeah. my son was two. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So it was, all, yeah. it was all international yeah. varieties. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Lots of. I also have booklets. I looked at the menu of the wines mm. of Turkey, a, a dinner that's been, you know, promoting Turkish wines outside Turkey. Mm. And uh, there are five wines for the dinner or six. And uh, four of them with international varieties. Mm. It's just, yes. yeah. Uh, so the uh, winemaker and owner of the second wine is among us, Jose. Maybe you want to mention a bit about your wine. <laughs> no. We love to. Yes. <laughs> ah. So, um, yeah. Sure. I, I love this wine. I love, and I'm not just saying that because you're here. I love that <laughs> sort of almost uh, Amaro character, that lovely sort of um, sweet sour, you know, in that really appetizing way. I also think the texture is really uh, succulent in this wine. I think it has a really kind of lovely silky um, sort of flow across the palate. It's actually quite different to wine number one. I mean, it's in a way I find it more um, not I don't, I mean, like playful. It's more like it's opening a conversation. You know, it's got a very like succulent, lively, um, kind of a perky you know, <laughs> character. I think the acidity is really lovely in this wine. I love the bright dancing acidity. It really kind of taps through the palate. Um, I mean, I, I think I've got a sommelier friend who would call this very smashable. <laughs> it's that kind of, that kind of um, character. Do you, I mean, what do you think? I really like this. It is very savoury, yeah. It's kind of, it, like you might was saying, it's almost got a kind of um, a savoury character or um, a delicate like pepper, um, mm -hmm. like fresh red pepper corns. Yeah. And that's what yeah, it reminds me of, you know, when they're really fresh, like they're almost fruity pepper. The idea, it was the first experience with this game, right? Cut the key. Mm. So, uh, course, there is cut on the scotch. Yes, mm. Mm. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 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 Mm.
So it should be like this uh, 100% and uh, uh, it's the natural yeast for, for that. And it was a couple of weeks of fermentation and it was the maturation, it was in a oboe tank, like egg safe tank. Mm -hmm. also, so maybe it's this savory or so it helps mm -hmm. is the, all the solids being in contact with yeah. the Mm. 100% and And you should mention mm. that it's only 900 bottles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> do, do you think you'll make it again? Will you? Yeah. Yeah, that's the point, actually. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. every, yeah, every other winery that contributed say <laughs> that, including Chamuja, that they will make Karasaka's okay, wines yeah. so from this year. Like, it was the first vintage, it was like blind eyes. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so so blind that I mean, you were there to harvest. I wasn't there to harvest our wines, and then you went to your own winery uh, with the grapes, yes. made the wine, and then uh, jumped on a plane to the other winery, one thousand kilometers away, to our winery to make our wines. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it's always yeah. cost more. So the production yeah. cost, the higher one, is not by far, it's not the grapes. And the thing is, I think this this grape is for us uh, because we have such a hot summer and we have so many savory dishes in hot summer. I think it's the perfect thing to because we have so many very very big muscle red grapes as well so i mean to me it's a really big uh you know summer wine <laughs> when it's a little bit chilled uh, by the way if you are familiar with turkish grapes most of the reds are either kara something or yeah. something kara black. <laughs> kara is black kara means black, black. Kara means so uh, this is a very funny example because the etymology is karasakas means the black chewing gum there's no explanation for <laughs> <laughs> but it translates as the black chewing gum. And the uh, Greek minorities that um, tended these wines and made out of wine out of them called these Mavropalia. Mavropalia. Uh, we tried to find a Greek uh, version of it, um, and we sent the uh, pictures, at least, of the wines uh, for an ampelographic uh, correspondence. And they said, uh, it looks familiar with Limniona from Greece. Mm. Then we gave up because Limnione is quite tannic compared yeah. to this variety, right. but it almost is identical. I mean, the mm. wines, the grapes, the bunches, but it's uh, definitely not the same variety. Okay. Number three and four, Pasheli now. Yeah? Yes. So number three and four comes from Pasheli, uh, who introduced this variety, who believed in this variety in the first place. Levon, I think, uh, Seyit makes, Pasheli makes wine out of Karasakas for the last 10 years or even more. Yes, maybe 10, 10 years. More. Yeah, he has been working on this variety for 10 years. So uh, number three and number four uh, are coming from uh, old vineyards uh, from the same village called Gedik. I think it's the second uh, village with the highest amount of vineyards. Mm -hmm. A little bit higher than uh, Çavuşlu. It's 300 meters in altitude. Uh, the difference is uh, in number four, four there is only 4% of Merlot, which he started. I mean, so he started like this. So uh, in 6N, six N. Uh, by the way, yeah. uh, if you look at the label 6N, it's a uh, play of words in Turkish. Uh, in Turkish, uh, it is uh, altına hayır, uh, which means no to gold. It's a protest against that mm. mining, Canadian mining company. So when you say 6N, does that sound like something in Turkish? Uh, in With, Turkish, it in sounds Turkish? like altı. Altı is six in Turkish, yeah. but altın is gold. 
So uh, uh, um, there's no gold. Yeah. No gold. Oh, okay. No gold. Altına hayır. No gold. Okay. He cannot say it. He cannot protest openly because then he would be. In you cannot uh, put the label. <laughs> okay. What well, so would happen that, if you if you protested openly? Uh, that that you mining cannot. company, yeah, oh, right. is a friend yeah. of the government. So <laughs> right. yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. Uh, it was ended. Yeah. <coughs> At least we were successful in a front like this. Yeah. Yeah. But they cut all the trees. I mean, it was the damage the was damage, done. Yeah. Because the government sells or uh, gives the uh, underground of the land uh, separate from the overground of the land. So there is this huge area of uh, olive trees in that area as well. They are giving to the mining companies underground of the olive trees areas. So there is. Luckily, that community is very strong in terms of coming together and protesting and put, pushing things out. So that's how they managed to <laughs> kind of so far keeping the things off their door. Both number three and four were fermented with native yeasts, by the way. And I, I think number four has been um, is actually quite widely distributed in sort of London on trade gets yeah. imported by Graft Wine Company, mm -hmm. Nick Darlington and um, his team. And um, Nick's been a really early champion of this wine. Actually, this, they're a super importer. Um, and I see this wine listed actually in quite a few restaurants. It, I think it goes really well with sort of that kind of almost the Ottolenghi cookbook style of <laughs> food, you know. So. Um, Again, it has something in it that I find um, really nicely, most paradoxical. You know, it has this quite ethereal, floral, savory perfume. Um, and then a really nice little, just, just enough resistance on the palate. It's interesting to try number three, which is 100% Karasakas mm -hmm. against yeah. number four, which has got a little bit of Merlot. Yeah, and the French four, oak. Four. Uh, and aging a little yes. bit, yeah. And in a way, um, the number I think four. I, I love this the slightly scratchier texture of number three. So it's always got a Grenache, Grenache, Grenache yeah. style scratchiness, and then number four has got that kind of buffed, polished, mm -hmm. yeah, um, feel to it. And uh, funnily, I mean, uh, for the Turkish market. I think it was first made uh, for the Turkish market, number four. That addition of Merlot, it means nothing. Uh, but it was just there on the label, yeah. Karasakız and Merlot, so that the Turkish consumers would be familiar with that wine. It's such an irony, you know? Yeah, they would buy from the Merlot, not from the Karasakız. <laughs> the Turkish, unfortunately. That's the way everywhere. <laughs> but now the Merlot is gone. Or it is more exciting. On the labels, there is no Merlot mentioned on the labels now. Mm. True. Which um, is a good progress. I think Sayit, who's the, the owner, he said that actually where he really found this wine being successful in Turkey was after it was successful in exports. So I think he's gone on to be very successful with this wine. You know, it's small production, but listed in smart places in the UK and in the US. And actually, he found that after he was getting that kind of validation from export markets, it then helped him to be able to actually sell it mm -hmm. in Turkey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it has so they almost have to go, <laughs> yeah, they kind of get the, the, the validation from yeah, yeah. abroad, abroad yeah. and then yeah. say, actually, you do realize that, that our varieties are, are also worthy of attention and, and are capable of top quality. It's, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's the case, unfortunately. Five? Mm -hmm. mm. Number five uh, comes from Suvla, uh, the other winery that has been using this variety in different renditions that you will find in the other room. So this is the year 2022. They were uh, not willing to send this uh, because this was just bottled uh, maybe, uh, maybe 10 almost, days ago. Almost yeah. tank sample, yeah. Yeah, so they just, I think they were worried that we would be unkind to it. So let's just, from, this is like, a, it's a little baby. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and um, I mean, Souffle make 
I think, great wines. And they've been a producer. They've always championed mm -hmm. native varieties, mm -hmm. haven't they? Yeah, yeah uh, to such an extent that they have seven wines in the other room, mm. yeah, coming from different native varieties, old wines. Thank you. This is their basic Karasakas. They have a reserve one aged in oak, and they have a Grand Reserve one yeah. aged for like 12 months in yeah. new oak, <laughs> yeah. which is... <laughs> and which also the sparkling one, yeah. which is yeah, Blanc de Noir, which is... Yeah. There was a sparkling they, they really committed into Karasakas, actually, yeah. mm. because of the price as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, actually, I think we could have chilled this a bit further, this no. one. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, again, this has that lovely kind of sort of bittersweet, savoury um, fruit. Exactly. Um, and that, um, that nice brightness. Exactly. Um, I like the fact that it's very unadorned. <laughs> it's just very um, sort of very transparent fruit, but oh, with sure, this kind sure, of almost sure. savoury. Nice, again, a hint of that little yeah. kind of... Yeah, it reminds me slightly of yeah, Grenache, do you know what I mean? That texture where it has almost that, that, that I think of it as a nice sort of scratchiness, you know, on the, on the palate. Um, I think that's actually showing very well. So when would they normally bottle that? In, um, in, a, in a few months, do you know? This one, yeah, in a few months. In a few yeah. months, yeah. In yeah. autumn, yeah, yeah. In they autumn, would be bottling yes. it. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, alcohol level of the wine so far we tasted, the first one was 15% alcohol, the second one is 13.5, uh, the third one is again 13.5, uh, the fourth one is 13.5, and Suvla Allow is... Allow me with them, yes. Yeah, 13.5, yeah. yeah. So um, any comments or questions about any of those first uh, five wines? Okay. So wine number six. Yeah, uh, six is made by uh, Yedi Bilgeler, uh, a producer, also a champion of uh, native varieties, but he tried Karasakas for the first time. Uh, just to show you uh, the different winemaking, Number six and number seven come from the same vineyards. Uh, the opening picture, if you remember, because the uh, Karasaka's leaves turn to a brilliant orange starting from October. Yeah, uh, number six and seven comes from this yeah. vineyard. Uh, it's our vineyard, by the way. Uh, but different styles of winemaking. I mean, number seven was made by Jose again uh, in a clay pot. <laughs> But number six was made in stainless steel, but coming from the same vineyard, same grapes. Uh, the alcohol content is 14%. No, 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 this one, the number six. Gosh, Dad, do you want to just grab number seven? Yeah, sure. sure. Number six was fermented with cultured yeasts and seven by native yeasts, by the way. Same vineyard. I love this photo, by the way. It's a great shot. Oh, they're so fascinating to try <laughs> next to each other. <laughs> um. Number seven, the alcohol content is 
So mm. two same vineyards, two different wines. Number seven. I believe that's right, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. So number Both seven, seven is made eight. by Jose, who's here. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it's a mix of stainless steel and clay pots, actually, yeah. but clay pots is much... When you say clay pots, what, what, what capacity You have shape? to show it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me is see. It like, um, is it like a covery? Yeah. Uh, it was made in Avanos in Cappadocia. It's mm -hmm. uh, 500 liters okay. in capacity. Let me so find. like a quivery shape. Yeah, yeah. big yeah. one. But it's yeah. uh, not buried underground. It's it's cursed, okay. It's, it's like, cursed, like a cursor in Armenia. Like yeah, that. yeah. Okay, so basically like a kind of, um, like a sort of squished egg. Yeah, like here, this. here there. Yes, yeah. yeah. These two, I mean, one of them is number seven, the other one is number eight. Okay. <laughs> yeah. This is me, this is Levon. Yeah. <laughs> so these are 500 liters made in uh, Avanos in Cappadocia yes. from local clay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Judging by the photo, that's the capacity a person can make it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very smashable. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Wine number, what I find really interesting about these two wines is how they um, express the tannins of the variety in two very different ways. So wine number six, I think, is much more a sort of um, a profile. Yeah, it's very integrated, isn't it? And kind of um, harmonious and, and succulent all the way through. Um, and it really, I think, um, has a, almost quite an ambassadorial style. You know, it's made in... Um, in a, um, a really kind of, um, yeah, quite seductive, um, very well integrated, um, quite, um, I mean, there is resistance in the tannin, but it's, it's quite sort of um, buffed, you know? Um, and, um, and then I, so it's not like the tannin has almost been like spread all through the wine. And then what I love about number seven is again, this sense of almost like a, you know, it's got a real rhythm, a real kind of snappy freshness um, and a kind of nice, lovely little whiplash of tannin on the on the finish. Um, so, I th you know, we're all interested because we're here on the diversity of different grapes and the value of um, vine diversity for climate change, drought resistance. But actually, the the if you're working on a project like this, the wines they make must be beautiful and interesting so you know it can't just be a, a kind of a curiosity mm -hmm. um and um and i think that actually the uh, i mean all of these wines i think have an innate tasty value <laughs> of their own and i think this kind of freshness in reds um is becoming more and more of an important quality in wine and you know we used to have an idea of also, almost like a, a bit of a binary <laughs> idea of what wine styles are in sense of whites, you know, reds. And, and have you noticed how all of these ideas with what a wine is, is starting to change? So you have amber wines, rosé that are becoming more dark and gastronomic, reds that are becoming really very much about um, vibrancy and freshness and acidity. And, um, and I've Personally, I love that about um, about wine, and I think we should keep embracing that 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 kind of real diversity in your idea of what can be beautiful and and how it can be beautiful. So um, I love tasting these two wines together. I think mean, it was really um, really interesting. What what did you think of them? I'd like to ask about the four. How is four made? Wine number four. Wine number four. Um, stainless steel, isn't uh, it? Yeah. No, there's oh, oak. There's three months yeah, of oak. Three, three months uh, of used yeah. oak. Uh, old oak in that. It's a mix of 96% Karasekas with just 4% of Merlot. Fermented with uh, natural yeasts. Partially barrel aged for eight months. Eight? Eight. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, it's it's uh, not eight. no no, no, yeah. six, no, no. It's three. Number, number that's three. number three. You've got. She's asking about number four. Number four, the six. Yeah. Which is six n. Ah, oh, right. Okay. The special six yeah. Yeah. I always <laughs> find a plastic smell. It's always yeah. there in different vintages. Also yeah. Doesn't have. Yeah. Mm. It's a bit like yeah. hubba bubba <laughs> or something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. 
doesn't have air here. So is it? Mm -hmm. so yeah. You will be picking up aromas and flavors that doesn't necessarily exist in the memory. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so there is always a new introduction. <coughs> yeah. I remember the first time we tasted this with you. Yeah. Uh, I said it's like a plastic uh, ball, and then when it goes flat, you just cut it out and use it as a hat when we were child. It smells like, it. and you said it smells like uh, the uh, bark of a watermelon. Yeah. 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 No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Chef's day off. <laughs> I wish. Yeah. Can, can I tell you, we did have someone register for this um, <laughs> session, and then, <clears throat> and then they would have said, um, "When will lunch be served?" <laughs> and I said, yeah, "Sorry, we're we're, we're a non-profit. We're not we're, we're not all treating you to lunch, <laughs> Trivet." And I notice he's not here. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> anyway, the food here is completely fantastic, and you should come back when um, <laughs> when chef is here. <laughs> I think number eight to next to this is also going to be interesting to taste. Uh, number eight comes from a different vineyard. Uh, this is the highest vineyard in uh, John uh, the Vinero uh, is actually here. Uh, we bought the grapes from him. Actually, I don't know did we pay or not, but it's yeah. <laughs> So uh, it comes from his vineyard. It's high altitude, John. It's about 500, 500 meters. No, this is actually 310. Ah. Uh, I think you're mentioning the, the Pacheli vineyards. Pacheli vineyards are the ones which are in the Five, 500. 500, yeah. yeah. Ours is at 300. Mm -hmm. This eight number, uh, number eight is in 310, 320 mm -hmm. down there. I might have missed if you gave the information. Within this area, it changes. I mean, it's basically uh, a lot of yeah. it's basically clay, of course, but there's granite as well. The, so the uh, the rock is granite. Uh, in our vineyard, you can find lots of granite uh, everywhere, but uh, it's a sandy clay. Uh, yeah, sandy the clay. The surface is generally a sandy clay, uh, but the main rock bedrock is granite. changes from like there is a river and where for example number seven is it's very like more clay but mm -hmm. for example in number eight where our winery is it's 80 percent sand sand yeah mm -hmm. we've been in that so mm -hmm. yeah, there's I only like little bits of clay mm -hmm. where yeah but fluxor is there so all the wines are grafted yeah. here in this region not all the wines not there all are the some wines ungrafted yeah, as well. still and there, there are no ungrafted wines uh, yeah, here in this selection yeah we cannot yeah define uh, ungrafted grafted here so on number eight i find something almost sort of um like fresh herbs like really um lovely um, like chopped mixed fresh herbs I don't know, maybe, is it not exactly tarragon, no. but there's something really aromatic, really nicely kind of pungent, yeah, thyme, yeah. that kind of like thyme thai and basil sage, yeah. or yeah, sagey, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, anise, yeah. And, um, I mean, I just want to keep sniffing it, really. It's just, mm, yeah, very, very nice spices. Jose, would you like to mention about the wine making? I mean, is there a difference between eight and seven? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm. 
But it's fully distilled when you put it in umbra. It's fully distilled. This year, yes. And um, it's really, I find really fascinating to compare the, what's a, you know, to contrast the two different um, tannic profiles of those two wines, seven and eight, just because um, obviously it's the same Completely variety, same yes. vintage, the same winemaker. Same harvest date. Same yeah. harvest date. Because of the cost yeah. of transportation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. Um, um, I really love that, that, that sense of, um, yeah, there's a bit more resistance in wine number eight. Um, and it's almost like the tannins have got a really lovely aromatic, like, soaking in them i think um um i find that really appetizing and i'm really intriguing and i think um i mean really when you consider all of these wines are essentially prototypes they've been slightly um rushed out to kind of come and meet us for this um event but i think i think we're right to do what we're doing because you know i think it would be a shame if we were never to be able to taste anything like this, you know, especially from Turkey. I know we've got Ben here who you sell um, quite a few Turkish wines. Um, and I, you know the Pesheli, sorry, I've got you with your raffle. <laughs> 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 Always. But I think you, you know the Pesheli wines, don't you? You sell yeah. those wines. It's yeah. very well sold through food, say, Mediterranean dining. Yeah. Food and customers coming in, they Greece and that area and want to try some else. Yeah. And do you think, you know, having tasted this profile, you know, it's Top something that, that has appeal and of interest? Yeah, you just have to set it up in the right way with the customer because it's so different from, you know, what they used to drink. So mm. I think you leave them into it or you trade them up to it. They, they like trying something new. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's like transition period for the English palate, I think. Yeah. It's like Issa was saying, you always have to build up your own internal lexicon because in a way it's it's really hard to define something until you've named it. Yeah. <laughs> and um yeah, and um, well, I mean I love that. It's like constantly learning new sort of flavour languages, isn't it? Um Well, um do you want to say Say anything else? Any more questions or <coughs> comments on, on those? I want to ask a question yes. about, you know, look at the map. <laughs> yeah. And it's so interesting when I look at all of the different vineyards and the altitude, and they're slightly different from the south and the north. And you have the Pacific Ocean, you have the Pacific Ocean, and the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. So, you know, the closer you come to, this, to the peak, the altitude start creeping up. Do you think? Uh, you know, in the future, people might start planting some wine mm. uh, Yeah, uh, it's a very deep forest, actually. So uh, it's, yeah, it's a forest. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is yeah. the Ida Mountains, and there was all. Yeah, uh, we resisted a huge winemaking, uh, gold mining company, and I think it's not possible to cut any more trees over there. It's yeah. a dense forest and yeah. it's not likely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Unless, yeah. <laughs> Which may happen in the future. We don't know how the climate will change. Oh, I bought, there's lots of, um, you know, there's producers even in Italy um, exploring and actually looking at bringing back um, arboreal viticulture and versions of because there are certain woods that um, have a kind of an anti-microbial um, effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like terebin tree as well, I think. Yes. One of them. Yeah. So actually, um, and this is even happening in um, Montalcino, you know, which is not known for its high level of <laughs> romanticism. Um, <laughs> I think there might be something. Yeah. 
damla sakızı öyleymiş. Damla sakızı antibakteriyel olduğu için. Tabii tabii. Onun için. Ay ya arboryalla ilgili bunu da okudum ama ben çok yeni okudum. Nerede okudum acaba dedim şimdi kendi kendime. Evet zaten aynen Red Sinai falan tabii, tabii. onlar çok aynı tür şeyler. Evet. 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 Um, okay. I just well, I'll start to wrap up because we've got some amazing wines to taste next door. Yeah. But I'd just like to thank the, um, you know, Umay, Gojdem, Sabiha, Lavan, um, for being open to this collaboration. We've known each other for a long time, and yeah. I was really delighted we were able to do this. I'd also really like to thank the IWSC Foundation. We have Tristan here from IWSC for really believing in this, and you were one of the first. Um, to give us um, a grant and you know you can imagine going to somewhere what we, we want to support this project to to research and make a prototype of um, of wines from a Turkish <laughs> Karasakis um, you know it's it's kind of it can seem a little bit esoteric but it's so important that we I think support these kind of projects because this is where I think the interest and the diversity and also the resilience of uh, the wine industry comes from, you know. And um, I also would really like to thank um, Isa and the team at Trivet for holding us here. Isa has an incredible Turkish wine selection okay. here. Um, just. Not just, <laughs> it's everything, but I love his list because it starts with the origin of wine first. So it starts with Turkey, Georgia and Armenia. Um, and um, and also my colleague Belinda, who's done a fabulous job. Yeah, of, thank, yes, you. thank you. Yes, thank you. So um, please do follow the progress of these wines. And actually, for the Old Vine Conference, we will shortly be announcing this the equivalent of this project for our next year, which. I think is going well it is going to be in in Chile we're going to be working with producers whose old vines were affected by the wildfires um, a similar sort of project so research that is applied and can be published and um, stimulates and shares interest and knowledge and tied to um, a selection of wines so that we continue with this link of putting these these wines and all the culture and the interest that they hold into a bottle and selling it for a price that reflects the kind of the love and the quality in the wines. Please do check out www.oldvines.org for more info. We also have um, a trade tasting on the 14th of June at 67 Pall Mall, a walk around tasting with some fantastic old vine wines from all around the world, including Turkey. Um, and it would be fabulous to see the um, details on our website. Um, and thank you. Thank you okay. so much, yeah. everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.